Marion, welcome to Waterstones. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, we have spoken uh, in the past remotely. We have. But I'm very pleased to have you in the room. Um, last time we were talking about your novel, Again, Rachel, which Thanks. was about Rachel Walsh, which was great. And here in this new book, My Favourite Mistake, we are back with Anna Walsh. Now, when we last spoke, you said that you're always guided by character first. So I wanted to ask why it was that you wanted to write about Anna. I mean, the strange thing was that I hadn't planned to write Anna at all. I had planned an ambitious novel, which was going to be set over 40 years, about seven people who had been friends in the 80s, and some had prospered and some hadn't. But the ones who had prospered had done so kind of at the expense of other people. And the idea of spending two years, which is the time it takes me to write a book, in the company of uh, terrible people, I just, I couldn't do it because the world already, you know, Russia had just invaded Ukraine and we were just, we were barely out of the pandemic and mm. the whole thing just felt so miserable that I asked myself what I did want to write and I had finished writing again, Rachel, which was set in the Walsh sisters and I thought, oh my God, I'd like to stay in that mm. world. I didn't want it to be a sequel. I wanted to write a kind of a standalone. Um, and I had had a book back in 2006, like, you know, in the olden times. And now she's, she's a different age. Her life has changed. And I mean, I wanted to write about two people, no longer in their 20s, but kind of late 40s, early 50s, who they've almost connected over the course of 20 years and various things have kept them apart from each other, including the fact that they both got married to other people. Um, but also, I wanted to write about something that had come up a lot for me during lockdown, which is appropriate shame mm. for actions and yeah, decisions I'd made when I was younger things that I handled badly because I didn't know myself enough or I didn't know how to be truthful or I didn't or I was trying too hard to stand my ground and I ended up being cruel and things like that came up for me and you know things that I had managed to outrun when we were out there living mm. our lives and it made me think about the fact that nobody gets to middle age without having accumulated or made decisions I can only speak for myself, you know, for which I'm genuinely appropriately ashamed of. Yeah. Um, you know, not toxic shame, not kind of bizarre shame, but things that if I had my chance, I'd go back and do differently. And the two people in this book, they have done things to each other that are, that had consequences. Yeah. Um, you know, like, they're not serial killers. I mean, they're not terrible. <laughs> These are not awful things. But but they had consequences and they affected each other and it just made me think when you meet a person who you knew when you were younger and it's been a, a kind of an intimate relationship i don't mean intimate sexually necessarily but you know where you've been friends or you've been close there will have been tensions as well as beautiful things mm. and i just thought how do we handle that in midlife what's the best way and how do we navigate it, especially if we're kind of romantically attracted to them? Mm. So there was all of that that I wanted to write. And, and I mean, basically my take is that like, we can't go back and change the facts. We can make them our amends as best we can, but mostly we've just got to learn to live with the things that we have done because we were human mm -hmm. at the time and we were less enlightened maybe than we are now. Um, and then I also wanted to, create a community in a beautiful place. I mean, I'm, well, I was looking for escape. Um, I mean, I wanted to write a, the book I wanted to, I would like to read. I wanted to read about escape. So I set it in the west of Ireland and just on the Atlantic. And it's a whole town which is hopefully a microcosm of the world. You know, you have like kind people, nosy people, badly intentioned people, funny mm. people, helpful people, dull people <laughs> and you know and to kind of throw them all into this rich stew and then put Anna and 
Anna's estranged best friend and a man that she once kind of almost nearly connected with put her in and just see how she fared as mm -hmm. a 48-year-old woman and she had done that thing you know the post-pandemic pivot that a kind of a surprising amount of people did yeah. you know she had had a job in New York that like like so many of us she found very very stressful and something about the pandemic made her think I can't do this anymore I, is there any way I could stop living this life what what would I have to lose and so she made that decision and you know we can only ever operate with the knowledge we have at the time and it was the wrong decision probably mm -hmm. but she made she she kind of worked with it I think any change once we once we start it it's so uncomfortable and everything is so unfamiliar that we regret it but I think human beings work we're adaptable mm -hmm. but we need time yeah so it's about that it's about adapting it's about revisiting mistakes shame it's about meeting a person that you almost had a thing with when but now you're different he's different the world is different how does it all look so that was kind of what i wanted to but i wanted to be i wanted it to be you're okay come on in nothing really terrible yeah that's the thing anything that happens in the book is it's only about human beings and small relationships mm -hmm. the outer world doesn't doesn't impact the way it would have done in, in my yeah in my the planned novel yeah okay that's really interesting so there's sort of far more sort of local focus because there, there is this sort of local politics that runs throughout the book but also I suppose with Anna returning to Ireland and to her family um, it's really interesting this sort of idea of how each member of the family has a, I guess a character that they have been to the other members of the family. And that in some ways the book is about people escaping their narrative, like who everybody thinks of them as being, that they've actually moved on. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I come from a family of five and, you know, long ago, like almost from the day we were born, we were assigned our role, mm. you know, like you're the clever one, you're the beauty, you're the worry. I mean, and, and definitely with the Walshes, like, I mean, Anna had got this amazing job in New York, like, and she was working in beauty PR, which meant that, like, all her family got free products. And, like, I mean, that is, that is the most wonderful thing. And she was their kind of their proper success story. Like, she had prospered in another country and, you know, used to jet in with, you know, a wheelie suitcase full of lovely things. And, and yeah, and she didn't want to be that person anymore. Mm. Like, she couldn't. I mean, yeah, like, she was burnt out. And again, like Anna is very uncomfortable with this burnt out phrase because they're so judgy about it mm. in, 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 in places like New York. Like it's just, you're not burnt out, you're just lazy or you haven't <laughs> enough vision. And, but she was burnt out and she wanted something different and she didn't exactly know how to go about it. And so she, she was impulsive, gave it all up and then, and then found that there wasn't really that safety net there to catch her. Mm. I mean, did, you know, it turned out to be okay eventually, but she was in that phase that it always surprises me when I'm back there. It's like, oh my God, I thought I was old enough to have outgrown this part of my life where I don't know what to do or I feel alone and helpless um, or I'm at this crossroads and, and nothing seems inviting. Mm. And I, I, you know, I'm 60 now, so I think that's, it's just, it's part of life. It's going to happen to us until the day we die. I think kind of aging into safety is not something that's going to happen, not for me anyway. And I don't really think it, because the world changes, but we also change. Mm -hmm. And, and they may not be exactly the same dilemmas, but dilemmas, dilemmas. I just want everything to be lovely. I just want to kind of be zen in a kind of a, a calm, dull way yeah. for the rest of my life. And, and that is never going to happen. No. Um, so I might as well just lean into it and see what I can, yeah, try and be excited about it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, another challenge. Lovely. Another confusing time where I don't know who I am. Lovely. Uh, you know, so that was how it was, is for Anna. One of the things, as you say, Anna leaves behind that the job and, and, and the beauty products. There's a lovely thing of them slowly running out as she's yes. back in Ireland. But the other thing that she's sort of is having to deal with is this change 
that's happening to her physically going into perimenopause yes, yes. and the sort of difficulty of getting the drugs that she would like oh, to have from her, yes. from her local doctor tell me a little bit about writing that because it felt to me that that sort of physicality for Anna is so important and, in, and becomes important I think later on in the book as well yeah I mean I think it's wonderful that so much has been written about the menopause and so many people have kind of taken the horror out mm. of the word but even though in the book like Anna mentions her menopause to to another woman she meets because she needs a doctor's appointment and the woman looks around kind of thinking <laughs> Jesus you know don't say it out loud or you'll curse us all um yeah like for so long it was kind of it was secret and if it wasn't secret it was something to be mocked and like the menopause is, is like going through the going through adolescence but in reverse mm. like it's it's a like the tide of hormones going out and I mean I'm talking about myself like the huge effect it had on my moods like suddenly I mean I was incredibly anxious because all that lovely calming estrogen mm. was was almost gone um, and then the rage um, like Anna there's one scene in the book where like Anna recognises that she's invisible, which is fine. Um, but she's walking along a sidewalk in New York and there's a you know, a group of kind of young men like just kind of larking about, like having a laugh and but they don't see her coming because she's now uh, of a certain age and she's invisible. So they're like not moving. They're still and so she's so angry of their kind of colonizing the sidewalk. Mm that she just kind of ploughs straight through them and and they're like really a, like what, what who um and i felt that a lot yeah that anger of like not so much being invisible on the sidewalk but um when i go to the gym which i do go to because it helps helps the anxiety not so much the rage but like if there are young men uh, in and my apologies to young men not all young men but like they're very, they're very shouty and loud and grunty and stuff. Mm. Mm. And sometimes I get, if there's one grunt too many, you know, I will yell something like, could you not? <laughs> or it, which is not the kind of thing I would have had confidence to do yeah, yeah, yeah. when I was younger. Um, so yeah, so there's the kind of the change in the feelings and then there's the change in her body. Like, um, well, the insomnia. Uh, like I've always been blessed with that but it got worse mm. and um, the, the hunger um, the you know the unpredictable periods like mm. which is it's kind of hard to plan your life when it's grand when it's regular and you know where you are yeah but like for Anna it isn't and that becomes awkward at one particular point um, <laughs> and yeah and like so when she started on the HRT and I you know and like it's not for everyone and there are many women I know who like breeze through the menopause and like it's lovely it's lovely to hear those stories but for a lot of people it's hard but it's it can be difficult to get the drugs um, some doctors are nice about it and some doctors are worried mm. or they don't get it um, like younger women or men I mean and I'm not being ranty about men but it's very hard yeah because it's you know people say you know well women have gone through it for like hundreds of thousands of years like it's no biggie but like you know we didn't used to have like general anesthetics either and having a leg amputated without them it's so much nicer when you have the general yeah. anesthetic so Anna has not been able to get um, HRT since she came back to Ireland and she is on the hunt for a doctor who would be sympathetic and prescribe it. It's not a big part of the book but it seemed absolutely appropriate to write it because she's 48. This is one further aspect of her life mm. um, and it would have been uh, weird I think not to just kind of what's the word incorporate it yeah yeah it's just it's just another thing what it was what it does allow you to do is suppose is to look at some really interesting aspects of relationships so in new york she has been together with somebody and this leads me to one of my favorite bits of the book which is some of the terminal terminology that you use to describe people i think possibly my favorite phrase in the whole book can you explain 
to the watchers what a feathery stroker is, please. Indeed, I can. No, I can't take any credit for it. <laughs> it's my sister Katrina and her friend Anne Marie Scanlon. They came up with it. They, they lived in New York back then. My sister's still there. And uh, one of them, I can't remember which one, had met a man and they'd gone home. And instead of sort of him taking ownership of her in, in, in their carry on, he, he stroked her very gently all night, like, and stroked her kind of like a feather being drawn along her skin. And who, whichever one of them it was said that it was unendurable, <laughs> you know, that they didn't want that kind of softness, yeah. that they wanted, you know, a headboard pile driver, which would be the opposite, I suppose, of a feathery, feathery stroker. And back then, like we were a lot younger, a feathery stroker was regarded as kind of a, a milk toast, yeah. you know, like a man who didn't, you know, and, and it, it became kind of worse. It, it widened to include more and more things like, you know, a man who was good to his mother or like a man who preferred dessert to a starter, you know, like really damning things. I mean, these are lovely, good things. <laughs> or like a, a man who stands up when you come into the room or, you know, a man who, I don't know, disapproves of porn or says it's exploitation, or, you know, like it, it made made them suspicious. It used to make me suspicious. Now I think a feathery stroker is, is the best thing in the world. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was younger then and we were all younger then and we didn't realize that like a kind man a kind person is the holy grail mm. um but yes a feathery stroker can be used in any sort of situation so long as it's affectionate yes you know it is a wonderful thing you know and yeah i would use it more as a, of a compliment now yeah i was being interviewed by a journalist the other day who had read the book and she said i just realized she said my husband is a feathery stroker. <laughs> I, was, I don't really know what to do with that. And I was like, no, 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 it's a good thing. It's a great thing. Really, be delighted. I had to look at my own feathery stroker tendencies and, and sort of, you know, have a little think about it. I, oh. I don't want to be on the wrong side of, uh, oh. of that divide. I don't but... really think it's possible. To, you know, <laughs> it's, if you have any feathery strokery tendencies, lean into them. <laughs> this is what we, what, it's what the world needs. <laughs> you see, this was back 20 years ago when the world was a lot... Judgment was crueler, but yep. the world was easier. You know, we need kindness and softness now and feathers and the whole thing, stroke greenness. Yeah. <laughs> um, in, in her relationship in New York, it, it's a great example of miscommunication between couples because, in fact, what she's interpreting is classic feathery stroker behaviour uh, or sort of slight weird washing of bedsheets by her yes. partner is actually him quietly dealing with her night perimenopausal sweats. night sweats. Yeah. Um, and it's just sort of one great example of that kind of cross purposes that can happen between people. Um, there's plenty more of that throughout the rest of the book. And, and you mentioned this sort of old flame, well, not sort of old flame, but somebody with whom Anna has had these kind of almost moments throughout yeah. her life, um, which is narky Joey. Again, another great phrase. Can you explain narky to yes. anybody who doesn't know what that means? Yeah, narky is, I suppose, an Irish word. For, um, for just being bad tempered the whole time, like somebody who was who just doesn't smile and who who kind of receives a greeting as an insult. How am I? <laughs> yeah, what do you want to know for? Um, and he just, you know, he's on the defensive, like the, he he's operates from a defensive position mm. the whole time. And he's almost famed for his bad temperedness. Um, so Narky Joey has been in Anna's life for over 20 years and Anna's sister Rachel is married to Narky Joey's best friend Luke Costello. So and all, and yeah you see poor Narky Joey is another person who got stuck in his identity. Yeah. Like he was Narky Joey 20 years ago. Narky Joey has changed a lot but it's that thing when we knew, knew a person back in the day we insist on them staying mm. in that identity. We're very, we kind of find it hard to kind of keep up with. And like, we are all changing. Mm -hmm. We are all evolving. You know, some, most of us are getting better. Most of us are getting kinder. And, and so it is with poor Narky Joey. There's an element w with the relationship between Joey and, and Anna. There's a lot of things that have happened in the past that, again, this sort of um, misunderstanding of, of what was going on. And there was 
one line which I thought was really important, which is that when Joey is talking about, you can see how much he's grown as a person and it's not the narky Joey of the past. When he's talking to Anna and he, he's talking about how he had treated her in the past and he says, it wasn't about you, it was about me. Yeah. His, his bad behaviour. And that made me think about what it takes to forgive somebody. So you were talking about having appropriate shame. What would it take for somebody to forgive somebody? And part of Anna's uh, skill is her ability to realise that it wasn't about her, to not take it personally, his behaviour. It was part of something that he was dealing with himself. Yeah. And that allows them, I guess, to build trust in each other again? Yes. Yes. I mean, that's a lovely thing to say. And I mean, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. Well, to be forgiven is beautiful, but to forgive mm. is also beautiful because carrying around anger or resentment, it's not pleasant. And I mean, we may not be aware of it for most of the time, but it's still, it's like a little stone in your pocket or something. It's, you know, so him broaching the subject of their past takes an awful lot of courage. Mm. But I'm a great believer in, in talking and, and communication. And, and I think once, once one person says, God, I wasn't, I'm not proud of the person I was then. Once somebody says something like that, it does, it does make everything easier. But it's a process. Mm. Um, but that's a very nice thing to say. The other person, I suppose, who's involved in, in this relationship is uh, Anna's best friend, yeah. who was married to Narky Joey. Joey. Um, and there's a really interesting part of the book, which is this look at intense friendship, yeah. which is very different to most you know, sort of normal friendships. There's, as you say in the book, intense friendships can end, and they're as devastating as any breakup would be with a partner. Yeah. Um, I think Elizabeth Day has written a bit about this in her she book, Friend of Holly. Yeah. But, but tell me a bit about that because it's such an important part of the book towards. Thank you. Yeah, there's a huge mythology around female friendship. It's like you meet, you somehow become incredibly uh, intensely intimate friends and you know everything about each other. And it's like we expect that friendship or that relationship to, to be crystallized with that intensity, with that level of loyalty and involvement and that there is no possibility for it ever to change, you know, for it to become something different but just as good, or for you to find yourselves on opposite sides of something. There's a huge amount of shame, I find, I speak for me, to be a woman who was really, really, really good friends with somebody mm. and for that friendship to have ended it's rarely spoken about, like, you know, there's all these phrases like, you know, men will come and men will go. I mean, I'm talking about heteronormative relationships. You know, men will come and, or men will go, but like your girlfriends are all, will, will be there for you forever. Mm. And if you break out of that um, truth, which isn't a truth, there's nowhere to put those feelings. You know, it, it, I've had people say to me, yeah, you know, we were... I used to have a really good friend and then it just all got a bit weird. There's shame, like so much shame. And like, you know the way like, there's also no room for people, for two platonic friends to go, look at, I love you, I wish you the best, but this is not working out. Mm. The way you can do it with a romantic partner, like, or you can go for counselling with a romantic partner and it may or may not work. Mm. But, and I, I actually think people, the youngs, have started to do the going for counselling thing. Mm -hmm. But that kind of, the talk with like, I love you, but I'm no longer in love with you or whatever it is, whatever way you want to put it, it's just not allowed. And I think most people lose one of those very intense friendships. And can it can be for any number of reasons. Um, and it's incredibly painful. It's as painful, maybe even worse than, at least people are nice to you mm. if, if you get dumped or whatever by a, like a, 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 a lover. But people don't know what to say. You say, well, uh, no, we're just, we're not, we don't seem to be talking. And uh, it was a load of different things, but people are like, 
well, you were a bit of a weirdo. How come you couldn't sustain a female friendship? You know, but yeah. all relationships are open to going wrong, whether it's, you know, a sibling, a parent, a work colleague. And the one that gets most written about is a romantic one. Mm. But in this one, it was a very intense friendship and for various reasons. Like it wasn't, that was the thing, it was presented as one reason, but it wasn't. It was lots, lots of things where like Anna was too afraid of confrontation to say things that she should have, that she needed to say for her own boundaries. And her friend Jackie was not interested in any sort of introspection. She didn't want to know about I don't know, personal growth or boundaries, or she just didn't want, and that's her. Mm. Um, and it all blew up. I'm going to take it away from the sort of personal stories because I'm so scared of spoiling any of the plot for readers. Okay. But you mentioned the community that you built. Yeah. And I'm really interested to hear you say that that, that was partly because of you wanting to, to escape the realities of what was going on in the world yeah. at the time and to create something that felt a little smaller and more contained. But there are conflicts there. Yes. And I don't think it spoils anything too much in the plot to sort of say that, that those things do get resolved. And I wonder what it is you think about that sort of community that allows them to find that resolution and whether there's something from that that we could apply to the wider world. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I, it was really important that it got resolved. And I think it was interesting that it was pragmatism that made it be resolved that not everything was fixed, not, not everything was tidied away in boxes, you know, where like the bad people got punished and the good people got absolved. But it was like, they realized that they had to live together, you know, that they had no choice but to proceed as a community, as a town, as people who interact with each other and like use each other's businesses. And that the best way to deal with it was to just park it, let it go, without without burying stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean that's not good either, because that that can erupt again. But just being kind of taking the position that like whoever did what they did, they did it from whatever need they felt at the time, and you know, it's usually fear um, or greed. But that sustaining the hostilities wouldn't benefit anyone. And not just anyone personally, but for the, the entire sort of ecosystem of the town could not have sustained uh, a judicial shakedown. Mm -hmm. That like putting it to one side Kind of knowing that it's there, that it happened, um, and that it's healthiest for everyone involved to not hold on to it. But that's hard. I mean, it can be really hard. Mm -hmm. um, but they all knew what was needed, and they did. There's also, I suppose, space enough actually for everybody to prosper in that yes. particular situation. Yes. Yes. Which, yeah. which doesn't feel like, I suppose, when you're in the midst of the dispute. No, definitely not. I mean, when they were in the midst of the dispute, the people reacted, as so many human beings react, as if resources are finite, or opportunities are finite, mm -hmm. more, more, more like opportunities are finite. And that turned out to be not the case. But I think it's very human to kind of look at a pie and think, well, if they're getting that bit, and I'm getting, where's my bit? Yeah. Um, but life, life isn't a pie. Our opportunities aren't pie-like. Life is unpredictable, is what I'm trying to say. And, mm. that what, and that when we react from a kind of a, a fear of scarcity, whatever it is, whether it's the scarcity of love, or um, it makes us afraid and, and sort of aggressive, and that it wasn't necessarily the case. It's hard to have vision when you're scared. I'm hoping that we've done an expert job of skirting any spoilers in this discussion. I think you have, you've been great. <laughs> yes, you have. Marilyn, it's really fantastic to talk to you about this. I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm actually surprised, I think, because of the strength of your characters and your dialogue, it's really interesting to hear actually how personal a lot of this book was for you. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. Oh, it's my honour and my privilege, of course. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Will. It's been lovely. Really lovely. Thank right. you.